Welcome to the France 24 debate. France is reeling from claims and revelations of incest. It began with a book by the sister of an alleged victim, her own twin brother, abused sexually throughout his teens by his stepfather, the uh, famous uh, political uh, analyst here in France, uh, Olivier Duhamel. Camille Kushner's book, La Familia Grande, has blown the lid off a massive social problem. What happened to her brother is classified as incest in France. In other countries, it might be called child sex abuse. All the more damaging because it's perpetrated by a person in loco parentis. Nonetheless, there's been a huge reaction with other people coming forward to state that they too have been sexually abused. One in ten people in France have experienced some degree of sexual abuse within their family setup. The group Face à l'Inceste, or Facing Up to Incest, says its research also revealed that most often the victim is a girl and most often an uncle is the abuser. A hashtag. Me Too incest was quickly coined. People started sharing their own personal shock stories on social media. Well, our guests to share their knowledge and offer their solutions in dealing with the issues raised in this discussion are Estelle Kramer, a midwife from uh, La Maison des Femmes. Estelle, thanks for joining us. And Benjamin Moronpuech, who's uh, a jurist, uh, a, a lawyer, and lecturer at Pontian Assas University here in Paris. Before we hear from our guests, let's hear from the French President Emmanuel Macron, who spoke earlier. Il nous faut entendre, recueillir les témoignages des victimes, même des années, des décennies après. Il nous faut punir les criminels pour leurs actes passés et pour empêcher toute récidive. La honte aujourd'hui change de camp. The shame is being shifted, and I'll add to that: it's about time, isn't it? Let's face it, because this is a horrible thing for anybody to go through. Uh, and clearly to have to justify uh, your complaint uh, must be the sort of the, the added insult to the pain that you're already feeling. So let's welcome our guests and Estelle Kremer, who's a midwife from La Maison des Femmes, and Benjamin Morenpuech, who's uh, a lawyer, uh, jurist, uh, researcher, professor at um, Pontian Assas University of Paris. Thank you both for joining us. Um, I don't know whether we're going to get any solutions to, to the problems that we're going to confront tonight, but I think it's good to talk about the issues involved and why this is such uh, a, a big thing now, right now in France, because if you look online uh, via the hashtag MeTooIncest, there are so many tweets and so many people talking about what they've been through. Uh, Estelle, were you surprised by this? Surprised that, the, that so many people are now choosing to share what they might have been through? No, because um, I've been working uh, with uh, victims of incest for years, and I know that uh, there is um, one of out of 10 women who, who are victims. So for me, it's not a surprise. Uh, I am very happy that we talk about these victims because these victims, they feel ashamed. They feel ashamed uh, for long times because they have been raped, they have been abused in their childhood. And most of the time, they don't understand at that time what happened. So they, they feel ashamed and they still feel ashamed for me, I, I see and I follow them for years, and it's like a handicap. It's like you have a handicap, but you can't see anything. And every day you have to go through this handicap to go um, out of it and to, be, to, to, live, to live with it for years. So me, I'm not surprised. I hope things will change in France. I hope victims will feel uh, able to speak and will be heard by the professional, because now it is not the case. Actually, many professionals are not aware of uh, these people and they, they are not trained to take care of these people. Estelle, thank you very much indeed. Let's bring in Benjamin now for, to get a first comment from him. Benjamin Moran Press, who's a, a jurist and research professor at uh, Pontion Assas. Uh, Benjamin, we heard there about uh, Estelle's work and the people that she works with who've suffered incest and how it is something that lives with people. And any kind of abuse in that sense lives with people and weighs on their personalities. This is something psychologists know. Uh, from your perspective, looking at this from a legal framework, um, I suppose punishment's not enough, is it? Because you can punish someone for the crime, but you can't take away the damage they've done to the victim. Well, indeed, and this is the question of uh, the compensation for the victims. But um, the main issue here are the limitation period, because as you may have heard, uh, when those cases are um, disclosed to the public, um, quite often the judges will say, well, it's too late now. 
And so for me, uh, one of the key issue here is how do you deal with limitation period? Okay. But maybe we'll go um, around this question la later. Do you think that was something that, I mean, Emmanuel Macron was saying that people need to be heard, the, 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 the sense of shame needs to be shifted onto the perpetrators, the people who've carried out the crime. Do you think, do you take any heart in what President Macron said there about perhaps there could be a change that you might be looking for? Well, indeed, it's, it's, uh, it's linked to limitation period okay. because for now, the right to investigation is limited. Um, that is to say that uh, when the d district attorney believes that the, um, clay, the, the, the case is too, too old, well, in this case, they say, we will not make any investigation because you're out of time. And so what you would need to do here, at least, is to uh, make a, sh a distinction between the limitation period, um, which open a right to a trial and at least a, a right to investigation. And uh, maybe we'll get back to this later, but uh, in, uh, when you look at international law, uh, there is a, a clear right to um, an investigation despite limitation period. That means that even though you're after those limitation period, you have a right to investigation. Indeed, it's uh, it's one of these things. That if it's it's almost like another insult, isn't it, to sort of say to someone, "No, it's 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 expired legally. We can't go back and investigate that." When inside, you still feel that pain and you feel it very sharply. Um, as we're talking, people are, are tweeting, and we've got a, a tweet here on our, our video wall uh, from uh, someone on. Uh, social media, obviously. Uh, I carried the shameful secrets alone all my life. Again, shameful secrets. This is a theme, isn't it? Uh, time to end the shameful practice of blaming the victims and ignoring the signs and symptoms of their abuse. Writing my memoirs was the best thing I ever did. One person there getting some kind of catharsis and closure on the horrible things that happened to them. Um, Estelle uh, Benjamin, can I put this to both of you? Uh, Estelle first. I is there something about French society which has this... Um, abiding respect of la vie privée, private life, which makes it perhaps more, which maybe helps hide these kind of problems. Estelle, what do you think? Um, I don't know if it's uh, about social things. The thing is, it's a family problem. It happens among the family and the family is, is something that is very, very crucial for people in France. So they are scared of putting uh, something out of the family and destroying their family. And also most of the time, we, the perpetuals, the perpetuals, they know, they know how to do, how to manage for the victim to keep the thing secret, you know. It's a, it's a strategy. The perpetuals are not uh, idiots. I mean, they, they do what is needed to be done for the, the victims to keep the secret. No, they can tell them, oh, if you, if you talk, maybe your parents will abandon you, maybe your parents will go in prison, maybe the police will come, so that the kid will not speak because he's scared at that time. You understand? understand and after, when people, they want, they, when people, they want to speak, first of all, they are scared of the reaction of the family because to, to say, even for me or for anyone, to say, I am being victim of rape, is something, you know, you cannot imagine yourself. So as they see, their family cannot imagine that. Themselves, they are scared to say, and they feel ashamed, because now in France it's a shame. And also, I would say, many, many professionals still don't trust victims. I see that every day. Police, uh, judge, any any professional, there is many prof They don't trust the people, so they don't believe what they say. So what can they do? You know, if nobody uh, is uh, is is can believe you, what do you do? But indeed. you just shut up and you continue to live with that. Indeed, Estelle, and, and, that, and that's, 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 the, that that's the problem, isn't it? People keeping this in, hiding these things. If you're a victim, yeah. you are stressed. You are feeling distressed. It's hard yeah. to look convincing and to present yourself in a convincing way to people who will be judging you about how you're speaking, how you're looking and how you're performing. Um, Benjamin, can I bring you in for a comment on, on that, uh, from, again, from a legal perspective? This is, is this a weakness in how things are investigated, a weakness in how these well, crimes, the incest or any kind of abuse is treated? In, indeed, we have a, a general issue in, in, in the law is uh, how do you take into account the psychological um, aspects of life? And um, the, the lawyers are not so well open to other disciplines, uh, especially um, disciplines that concern the brain. So this is one of the reasons why we're going so slowly in these topics. 
hopefully um, there are some international committee, like the Committee Against Torture, who start to say um, in the beginning of uh, 2012 that uh, we should uh, take into account the lifelong psychological effects of uh, sexual abuse on child. And they were the first to say, therefore, we need to get rid of limitation period because of these uh, lifelong psychological effects. But when you go back at the national level, when you go back at the district attorney, at the policemen, at the police officers, um, at everybody who works on sexual abuse in France, they are not so well trained right now. And that's why tomorrow we are organizing in my university a big symposium on sexual abuse. Um, and we, are, uh, we decided that it was absolutely necessary to invite psychologists to make their uh, knowledge um, be better known by the lawyers. Indeed. It sounds like that is an essential area. Staying with you, Benjamin, please. It sounds like it's an essential area where ground needs to be covered by, by, by your profession, but by the psychologists, but how about by the police as well? Well, indeed, um, as um, my colleague just told you, there is a, a, a lack of trust in, in, the, in the word of the people. It's also very hard to, to understand the, the mechanism of um, uh, traumatic amnesia. Maybe you, some of your, your, um, the, the people who listen to us don't know this uh, mechanism, but uh, sometime when there is a very violent um, event, um, your brain just disconnects and uh, you forget for the event for years because this is the only way to, to keep on with your life is to forget about this terrible event. And one day this event just reappears. Um, Muriel Salmona, which is a psychiatric in France, studied this phenomenon a lot. And maybe you heard last week we had this uh, members of parliament who just revealed to the press that he had been victim of sexual abuse when he was 11. And that one day when he was much older after this event, he just started to remember it. And it was a big shock for him. Well, this thing is very hard for lawyers to understand because they say they, they don't really believe that amnesia is something possible. So you have to train them to, to, to make um, them realize that this thing exists and they have to take them into account when they, they talk about limitation period. So, go ahead. No, 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 it's, it's, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you're saying, Benjamin, because it's, it, it's, it's interesting that France is now coming round uh, to, to seeing these things that I'm sure to you and I'm sure to Estelle uh, seem to be incredibly clear and obvious. And, and perhaps Estelle, just to bring you back in on this one with your experience of, of the people who've been through these horrible things. I, I mean, how do they begin to rebuild when they have a system that is, it seems, against them? Uh, the first thing to help them to rebuild is to link the symptoms they feel with what has happened to them. Because most of the time they have some symptoms, they have many health problems. Uh, there is many scientific studies that have shown now the health problem uh, linked to uh, uh, sexual abuse. So, but themselves, they don't know that this can be linked to sexual abuse. You know, for example, some they have neurological problem, gastrological problem, and this can be linked to the trauma. And for them, it's a, it's a, it's important to understand that when they understand that so then they can they can try they can start to rebuild themselves to to be treated by some people and also what is important for them is to offer different therapy is there is a psychological therapy yes but there's also body therapy there is also a group therapy that is very, very useful group therapy because they can see they are not alone. They see that there is one other, another, another, and that all of them in the group, they feel the same. They have been through the same feelings, the same uh, sh shame, the same life. So then say, I'm not alone and I am not mad because most of them, they think they are mad. They think I am mad and the other are good. And then they feel, okay, I'm not alone so that I can start to reveal, I can start to heal. But you know, it, they will never, it will never end. It's like really a handicap and day by day, they can feel better, but it will never end. Indeed. And One I, thing I want to say so, also is Please carry on, Estelle, please carry on. Yes, a big problem in France is that you have to bring evidence to the police and to the court to be recognized as a victim, you know? How can you bring 
evidence when you have been raped and you were like 10 years old, it was in your bedroom by your stepfather or by your uncle. I mean, surely the perpetuals will not take pictures, will not say to everybody they have raped this boy or this girl, you understand? So there is no evidence. Nobody knows. It's like at night, it's like somewhere hidden. So they have no evidence. So when they go to police, when they go to the court, people, police or court ask them, OK, bring evidence. They say, I have no evidence, you know. And that's, that's a big problem in that, France. And that sense of isolation as well, the victims feel, is, is a massive issue too, isn't it? That sense of, I'm sorry yeah. to talk over you, Estelle. That sense yeah. of isolation that the victims feel is a massive, massive problem. Yeah. There's another issue we haven't quite dealt with yet in the particularly in this case regarding Camille Kushner's book, La Familia Grande, um, the sense coming from what she's been saying that it was actually something that people knew about, that people didn't report, that people who knew the family knew about and didn't talk about. Um, how much do people need to sort of take responsibility uh -huh. and actually sort of speak up and talk about these things? Benjamin, can I ask you? Well, in France, um, there is a, a criminal offence by itself, um, which says that uh, when you know something uh, that has been uh, very um, bad for society, you are obliged to denounce it, uh, to, to speak out about it. Uh, but the limitation period for this specific uh, offense is very limited. So you have this obligation to, to speak, but um, the limitation period to, to, to charge you, if you for not having spoken is very limited. And maybe you've seen in the media uh, we had this uh, position of the famous attorney Jean Viel, who yes. was a friend of um, Mr. Duhamel, and the, um, basically his defense says, "Okay, I, maybe I should have talked. I should have talked, but uh, you know, I was bound by um, professional secret. And anyway, now it's too late. Uh, you cannot uh, charge me for this." Um, so this is also something that need to be think about um, when talking about limitation period. Not only change the rules for the main um, um, offense regarding sexual abuse, but also the the other offense regarding uh, the lack of uh, speaking out when you know that something very wrong has happened. Indeed, I know the story you were telling us, Benjamin, and in your retelling of this story, it makes me angry thinking about the man making that decision to stay quiet. Estelle, what would you urge people to do? Uh, in this situation. We're coming to the end of our first part now. We're getting to the final comments. What would you urge victims to do? What would you urge people who know anything about what's happening to do? But obviously, I will urge uh, as much as they can victim to go to specific um, uh, structure like La Maison des Femmes, which can help them and which will uh, listen to them and which will believe what they say first of all, and they, they can also now go to health professionals because many of them are well trained now, uh, doctor and um, GB, what do you call you say in English, GP, yeah. and people among their family, I will urge them to speak, to speak out. The problem is that people, they don't speak out because they are afraid, even themselves, if they see something, to say that there is something wrong happening in their family. So I will urge these people to speak. There is specific uh, phone number where they can speak anonymous if they are scared. So they can call this number in France, it's 119, and say anonymously what has happened or what is happening uh, close to them in their family or with their neighbours. Well, that number 119, Estelle Crème of La Maison des Femmes, thank you. Benjamin yeah. Moran Push from uh, the uh, Pontian Assess University Research Professor and Jurist. Thank you, sir, very much indeed for explaining your aspects of this. Uh, well, it is a disturbing topic, but one we feel is important and we need to confront one in ten people in France victims of incest, according to research. Uh, stay with us, more to come. That's uh, part one of the debate. Welcome back to part two of the France 24 debate. We are discussing the crime of incest in the light of the claims in the book by Camille Kushner here in France, uh, talking of a twin brother's ordeal at the hands of their stepfather, a well-known political commentator, Olivier Duhamel. Our guests for this part of the discussion are uh, Tal uh, Peter Braumerx, who's a doctoral student in philosophy specializing in political theology and gender. Hello. Hello to you. And Nicolas Martin, producer of France Culture. 
The book by Camille Kushner, La Grande Famille, uh, La Familia Grande, uh, details the issues faced within family groups pushed together in remarriage. Now, these things don't happen to everyone, but the campaign group at Face à l'Inceste, or Facing Up to Incest, says at least one in ten French people have experienced some kind of incestuous abuse or harassment. It is the problem that people know, or at least suspect, but they say nothing. In the case of Camille Kushner's brother, his suffering may have been an unspoken shame within Paris society. People knew, uh, didn't speak. Uh, Tal, Nicola, thank you for joining us, both of you. Um, I'll start with you, uh, Tal, if that's OK. Um, do you think this issue about the sort of the code of silence, people not wanting to talk about these things, maybe being afraid to speak up, is one of the big evils of this whole problem? Well, the, the problem is that people speak actually alert. It's not that no one uh, speaks, because most of the victim it's really hard for them to speak up against it. But when they do it, actually, when, when they speak up against uh, those kinds of violences, no one wants to hear it. And I think that's one of the main uh, problem concerning incest. Yeah. It is uh, obviously a big issue. Uh, and, and from this, um, what originated as an incest uh, kind of uh, hashtag, um, confession or, 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 or witnessing of what happened. Uh, another one came about that, talking about uh, gay issues too. Uh, Nicola, can I bring you in to talk maybe, uh, maybe about that, maybe about that issue, about sort of the fact that this has really lifted the lid on a whole number of places where people have been abused in different aspects of their sexuality, their society, their lives. I think I think what's important is that uh, there was like first the Me Too hashtag, then Me Too incest hashtag, then Me Too gay hashtag, which makes this uh, reve revelations, this confidence, like this public confidences, as kind of a very strong and powerful wave saying that this events are not single events that belongs to the private sphere. Because when you've been raped, uh, like everyone, women, gays, uh, it's true for ancestors, but it's also true for every kind of vulnerable people or minorities. It's true for trans people. It's true for like sex workers people. It's true. It's true. It's true for um, migrants people as well. Then you realize that it's not just like um, like uh, isolated events that just occur in the privacy of the bedroom or that just belong to a secret for the family or the group of friends or whatever. It's massive. We are talking about a phenomenon that is like really like a huge wave that goes over all, uh, well, our society. And it's like obviously linked to the shape of this society because there is one common point on all these rape events uh, can they be like exert well when, when it happens on a woman or on a gay or on a trans people or on a migrant or a sex worker is that they are all the fact of men that men which are like we, we, who feel like free enough and empowered enough to dominate abuse and destroy these vulnerable bodies and that is I think the main political issue and lesson about this all testimony and this wave of testimony that we can see on Twitter. Um, I, I'll, I'll share something with you I haven't shared with people before, but I mean, when I was younger, it's it, something kind of nearly happened to me. And again, this, this thing you pointed out about power and strength, you know, it was an adult trying to force me to do something and I managed to escape. I was lucky and I thought that never affected me. Later in life, I found it did affect me. It's something that weighs on your heart. It's something that weighs on your soul and it does affect you. You've got to talk to people. I mean, do you have these kind of experiences where, you know, you know exactly what this is about and you know exactly sort of how it feels to go through this? The thing is, um, once more, I think I think it's because I had the luck to overcome it because um, because uh, of a lot of like things that I would not enumerate here because it would be looked too tedious. But I had the luck to work on myself and to be strong enough and to find the good people, the, the good person to overcome it and to be like the one, the people standing in front of you right now. Uh, not everyone had this chance. And for some people, it has just been like too strong and too destroying. And some of these people 
uh, may have even killed himself. So that I think is thing that we should ev that everyone had and should have in mind. But about your question, I really think that we are struggling and we are dealing with something that is uh, once more systemic and massive. I mean, we are living in a system where men are um, like empowered to like i mean it's called patriarchy and i i, I really i really think that we i mean so for some people i know this word can be a bit complicated to handle because it's like well this is a leftist thing it's like oh god this feminist thing uh, once again but when you think about it when you see that like like maybe one of a to maybe more than that, like nine on 10 women have been harassed once in their life. When you see that, like for Me Too incest in France, we realize that one people on 10 are concerned. When we talk about Me Too gay, and that some of like the polls like make you realize that one people, one gay people on three or on two have been er sexually harassed or raped, then you can't, you really can't consider rape as being like an accident. This is systemic and it is systemic because the shape of our, of our society like is really constructed about the power of the male uh, and that's some of the perverted elements of it. I'm not saying that every male is a rapist, of course, I am not saying that, but actually you can realize that it gave this perverted people the power and the freedom to abuse these vulnerable bodies. And I, when I say vulnerable, I see, I, I, I'm thinking about uh, the, the, the fact that this society, the shape of the city, vulnerabilize women, it's vulnerabilize like minori sexual minorities, um, disabled person, et cetera. So that's, I think, and this is the thing we should all think about as like decent person and saying, Rape is not like, um, well, isolated events. It's really like something systemic that we should address and that our directions and that like politics should address like really as a massive uh, like soci societal event. Nicola, I hear what you're saying. Before I bring you in, Tal, to respond uh, to that, let me just... Uh, share something that's on social media again about about this issue. I'll read it out because it's it's up on the wall. I don't know who needs to hear this, but the uh, Me Too incestor hashtag uh, can be a trigger for survivors, even though you felt better and that's normal. No need to feel ashamed or beat yourself up over it. If you feel it affects you, mute it, log off, do whatever it takes to make you feel better. I'm not quite sure whether that's saying you should hide from what you're feeling or whether you should confront what you're feeling. Uh, but certainly one thing about this, Tal, I suppose, is with everything now being spoken about, many people, maybe even watching this debate, listening to what we're saying, might feel disturbing feelings coming uh, out of their mind. Well, I think testimonies produce a need for recognition, right? Or a need for change. And also, you, when you testify, you feel vulnerable because sometimes you never said it be, uh, before. And... Um, Many people on social media, for example, many people are going to be aware that you had been through that kind of um, violent event. And I think it's it's essential to um, to speak up and to to gather those testimonies. But then we need to think about the way we do it. Um, what what are the what are going to be the answers? Uh, after we, we 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 heard those testimonies, and I think well, it's essential to think of like um, uh, the the power the dynamics. For example, um, Nicola said uh, the patriarchy, so the power dynamics between men and women. And I also think concerning incest um, and violences uh, within the family that we need to address uh, the topic of um, power dynamics between adults and, and children. Uh, because most of the time um, we heard that incest uh, is possible because uh, kids are vulnerable, because they are like naturally vulnerable. And I think it, it is, we, we could think of um, children's vulnerability as a production 
we need to think um, about how do the, for example, the family institutions produce vulnerability, produce violence, because, uh, for example, within the family, kids um, are going to be um, under the dependence of their parents. Uh, they are like economically dependent, but also materially and sy symbolically dependent. And then it enables um, violence to perpetrate, to, 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 um, to happen. So we, we should address those uh, topics. Most of the time, I think after um, uh, Me Too, um, the first wave of Me Too um, testimonies and then uh, concerning incest, the answer were more like uh, repressive answers, uh, such as um, a new age of consent or um, juridical answers. And I think it's not enough. I think it's, it's important to think of what do we do when um, the, the victims uh, spoke, but also we have to think about what do we do in order not to, um, in order, for instance, not to happen or again and again and again, and and f the family uh, and to observe the, the the power dynamics within the family is is really essential to me. Indeed, the family, of course, is should be the place where you are nurtured, where you learn about life, where you learn to 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 be kind, to love, to give, to take, to to share, and then for something like uh, incest to happen. Uh, and, and to break that down, it, it kind of betrays that trust that a child has in, in the adults uh, around them and obviously can really damage people uh, going forward. And I think, as, you, as, you, as you're pointing out, Tal, it creates a cycle uh, which repeats itself generation on generation. It's one of these things that really needs to be broken down completely uh, to, to stop it happening again and again. Many uh, people who abuse were themselves abused when they were younger. And just to remind uh, people watching this, uh, one in ten French people have experienced some kind of incestuous abuse or harassment. And in terms of the actual uh, abuse, say, for instance, of a woman in French society, it's probably nine out of ten that have had some kind of brush with some sort of um, sexist or sexual harassment uh, throughout uh, their day. Um, Nicola, can I come back to you and, and ask how do you start to break that cycle? Uh, it clearly, I, I, I don't expect to have all the answers, but do you have a, a, an opinion on how that cycle can be broken? Well, I think uh, we all should be very careful about the cycle you just described because, um, because uh, it is a situation, but it is not the majority of situation. Um, uh, I've never like really, and I'm like saying that to, to you and to everyone that listened. Uh, I've, uh, it's not because I've been abused that I've like had abusive thoughts, like not in a not a single like a single moment in my life. And actually, talking about my abuse, um, I was you know uh, it happened when I was 11 first. Uh, the guy that abused me was a neighbor. He was 16 and a half, so he was still a teenager. And uh, it, it lasted for a long time, like for many years, not in continuous uh, like abuse, but it was like for a long time. And, um, and it took me a very, very long time to first figure it was an abuse because it was like, well, it could have been like, like you know, a relationship. Okay, it was a bit like... I don't know, sometimes rough, and uh, I didn't always agree to what he was willing to do, but I was like really feeling guilty about it because I do like experience desire. And then like long time after I realized that I, it was first, it was blackmail because it began as a blackmail. Uh, and then I realized that it was actually rape because I was... Uh, under his influence and I was not aware of what was happening because I was a kid. And then a long time after having recognized that it was a rape, I was 26 when a friend of mine told me, but do you realize you, you were a child? And then at this moment, I was 26, I've been like in therapy for five years yet. And then I realized that I at 11 had a child's body and he had an adult, a grown, man body and i didn't realize it and i didn't realize that it was pedophilia so i don't know if this guy was abused when he was young but i really don't want to stress out the fact that abused or abusing men are reproducing the pattern or that abused child are like trying to 
at some points reproduce a pattern. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I've, you know, I'm sorry if I react a little bit strong about that, but. Uh, uh, you know, Nic uh, Nicola, you didn't I've... react strongly at all, sir. And can I just clarify that what I was saying was was not that because you, for instance, were abused, you would become an abuser. I, 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 that's very clear. That's not the case. You're a person of, of a great rounded okay. personality and intelligence and emotional intelligence. And you've worked on yourself and got through things that many people won't get through. Many people who are abused, of course, do not become abusers. And that's obviously one of the hopes that we have. Um, Thank you for sharing that, Nicola. I think it really helps. Thank you for making it clear. No, no, it, it helps me to get, it helps me to understand, and I think it helps our viewers to understand too uh, the depth of the situation. And uh, I, I can't sort of stress that clearly. Not everybody becomes an abuser, but men, some some do. Um, can I just kind of picking up what you're saying, and both of you really? Does the fact that France for so long has had kind of a, a very strange relationship with the idea of age of consent? Is this one of the problems? Would it not help if France had a, you know, an age of consent which was set at, say, um, I'm, I grew up in the UK, 16 years old? You know, if, if it was put at that, it would at least sort of in a legal framework show that, you know, if you're an adult and you're showing an interest in someone who's 16 or younger, you've got a bit of a problem. I'm not really sure because I think... When you fix, when you set an age of consent, for example, uh, you fix the age of consent on um, 16 years old or 13 years old, you're going to have strong debates. Is it is it too young? Is it too old? Um, and for example, right now, people, some women, for example, are sharing pictures of themselves when they were like 13 years old, and they're saying, "Look at myself. I look so young. I have a, a child body." But I think. Some women, for example, when they are uh, 13 years old, they do have an adult body or, or grown-up um, body. So I think the the issue of the age, it's always you're always going to have some discussion because it's kind of arbitrary, right? So you have the age, but why why could it be that, for example, 17 would be a, a, a right age? And I think if you don't work on the power dynamics, if you don't work on uh, Power dynamics between uh, men and um, women, between adults and uh, adults and child and children, then it's nothing is going to change. It's not because afterwards you have that age of consent that uh, the, um, the the power structures uh, are not uh, there like from before. Hmm. Nicola, your thoughts on that one? Age of consent is that something that should be set? I'd suggest 16 because I grew up with an age of consent at 16. Do you agree with Tal that actually the age of consent is it, it doesn't matter? Nicola Martin, I'll try again. Are you? Are you uh, 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 yes. the, the, Nicola, the, the issue of an age of consent. Where do you stand on that? This is a very complicated question. Uh, I am no one to judge or to say what uh, should be the age of consent because it's a very, very, very complicated question. Um, what I can say about it is that uh, I think um, the law and the, the, the judge's de decision is always, I mean, I'm. I don't. I, I really don't. I, I. I haven't. My. I haven't cleared my mind on this question because I. I, I do understand that, uh, uh, like a, a sixteen-year-old teenager can like be in love with a fourteen-year-old teenager because in France we're discussing the fifteen years old age of consent and that should be normal and that shouldn't be characterized as rape. Um, I, I. I think. I think it should be maybe, but. You're, you're, you're taking me a little short on that because I, I'm not I'm, I'm not a, a legislator, I'm not a jurist, so I really don't know all the tenets of, of this question, which is like really sensitive and really complicated. But I think that listening, first of all, okay, let, let, let me say you that. B before thinking about legalizing the age of consent, what we should do first, and that would be much more important and much more uh, strong and in, uh, and intelligent is like form the people that receive the um, uh, uh, the, the rape declaration in the policemen, everyone that are like supposed to 
listen to the victims, and that we have now plenty of testimony of this questionary, this inquisitions being like very, very, very out of the way, people being not formed, asking very, very like out of place question, and just please help these people, our policemen, to get formation, tuition about just how to receive the words of someone who are coming to you and uh, complying and uh, putting like a, like a complaining about a, a rape or a sexual abuse. And this is something that really, I think, is much more important about like, like intellectual thinking about should it be 16, 15 or 13. Uh, I think judges are like clever enough to know where there has been an abuse situation and making like this like a kind of like very hard and uh, objective limits are not helping anyone. Nicola Martin, I'll just summarise so our viewers will completely get exactly what you were saying there. Um, the, the crux of what you're saying, the police, the investigators need to be themselves trained in how to cope with this kind of crime, deal with the kind of victims coming forward and telling their stories and know what to listen for, not judge them on what they see, not judge yes. them on what they think, but judge on what that person says. Take it from there and investigate things fairly. Nicolas Martin of France Culture, thank you for sharing your personal experience with us and your point of view. We really appreciate you uh, joining thank us you. here in France 24. Uh, Tal et Peter Baumerx as well, doctoral student uh, of uh, philosophy specialising in political theory and gender. Thank you for your perspective as well. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and Thank thanks you. to you for watching too, or at home or wherever you are. Uh, if you have any issues related to this or feel involved in any way, don't hesitate to seek uh, professional help or even speak to the authorities if you have something to report. And uh, we, of course, will continue to uh, discuss these issues and hopefully try to uh, help people to come to terms with how things are. The situation in France, one in 10 people, it says, uh, suffering some kind of incestuous abuse or harassment at some time in their life. This is the France 24 debate. Do stay with us.